this panel represents, um, you know, industry, represents government, and we're here to talk about ICAM modernization. Uh, 2019 has been a banner year, really, for federal government. We finally got some guidance from the White House. Um, the administration released the OMB memo 1917, if you haven't heard it. Um, it is the new improved policy for identity credentialing and access management. Uh, this builds on our FICAM initiatives that we started 10 years ago, 11 years ago, 2008, 2009. Um, I was involved in the development of the FICAM roadmaps. Um, that focused on HSPD 12. This is a reinvigoration of some of those activities, some of the identity, lifecycle management, access management activities. So in the, in the memo, um, I, I have some key points here that I'm gonna bring out. And there's new technologies that are ad addressed in the memo. That's kind of what they're talking about there is the access authentication methodologies, right? Um, I guess it was 2017, uh, there was the NIST digital identity guidelines that kind of reset how we were thinking about level of assurance and access management. Um, what this has done though, you know, the prompt here, we look at, um, as Darren was talking about, zero trust, the change in how we're thinking about security. If you look at the amount of breaches in, in exposed data, whether it's social media or an agency breach, a commercial enterprise, a, a SaaS platform, um, there's a lot of personal identifiable information that's been breached or exposed. Um, we're having to use the, our information more frequently. Um, so, so that's all drivers of, of the memo. And, and it's forcing us to look at how we're doing identity proofing, how we're doing, um, you know, establishing identities and tearing down those identities when uh, the relationship ends, whether it's a contractor, whether it's a, an employee, uh, we need to be able to have that control. Um, so the memo does a good job of talking about that. Um, PIV credentials, they've stayed in play. Um, there was some noise a little bit ago that they might go away. And um, at FedID this year, you may have heard um, Tim talk about the, the CAC in, in, in the Department of Defense. It's not going anywhere. But what we are doing is we're looking at other authenticators. Um, we're looking at, at different authentication authorization technologies. This is all creating um, a lot of churn uh, for agencies such as, as Karen and her, and her organization. They're having to rethink um, how they're granting access, how, what credentials they're allowing, um, device credentials, things like that. Um, the memo also directs uh, agencies to accept credentials from other agencies, something that we've always struggled with. How do we interoperate between government agency to government agency, government agency to uh, the public? You know, that has been a challenge. We don't want to be reissuing re credentials constantly. Um, so that builds, you know, again, building on, on, on the NIST guidelines uh, for identity. Um, the memo states, specifically, while hardening the perimeter is important, agencies must shift from simply managing access inside and outside of the perimeter to using identity as the underpinning for managing risk posed by attempts to access federal resources. This sounds a lot like moving towards that zero trust model. Um, and, and that's exactly what they state. Agencies are moving towards that zero trust model, but it changes us to think about security and how we approach it. Um, that becomes extremely critical, you know, as we just heard from Darren. Um, one thing to point out, you know, agencies have more identity data, and I'm not going to steal Bobby's thunder and, and Bill's thunder, but agencies now have more identity profile data to make some of those decisions. Um, so without further ado, um, we're going to get started. And, you know, this, as I said, this, pa this panel, um, we come together, we've built a cohesive model that addresses the requirements. Um, it's a seamless integration model. You know, this is industry coming together. Um, we, there's no mergers, acquisitions up here. We've come together as industry partners to solve this problem for government. Um, and, and I think that that really stands a lot to what's being said is this problem's complex. It's not an easy problem to solve. And there really is no one vendor that does it all. Um, so 
to get started, I'd like to start with asking Karen a question and say, you, you know, as a leader in security in, in, in your organization, what were some of your concerns um, and, and how did you guys get started? Where, where did this, you know, what was your driver? Wow. Um, you know, I, I kind of stumbled. I, I stumbled into into this space a little bit. You know, I'm old. Um, I turned 57 a few months ago, and I feel old. Um, I was in government before. I was in the private sector. I came into the Directorate of Defense Trade Controls of the Political Military Bureau at the State Department. Um, and the first week I got there, I was like, oh my God, what have I done? Because the systems, I mean, talk about modernization. I mean, the systems were so old. People talked about air gap network. I had to look it up on the internet. Every single thing that anybody said, I had to look it up on the internet, figure out what it was all about. I was unfamiliar. I'm actually, I never even saw this memo. How do you think, what do you think of that? I never even saw the memo until Frank sent it to me. But um, what I do know from my 57 years and my 30 year career in, in and out of IT, in and out of government, is that identity is at the center of all of it. Access control is at the center of all of it. One of the problems I'm having with my modernization is that you know, we work with 13,867 industry partners. And that's who we are doing business with. And the State Department writ large doesn't even see necessarily my use case as something that they need to be concerned about. So we have 13,800 and so companies that want licenses to send defense articles and defense services overseas. That means technical data, it means warships, it, mean, it means everything that you can imagine. Um, all the weapons um, that you can even think of, um, including guns, uh, which we're trying to move over to commerce shortly, but it includes everything. And so we've got these 13,000 entities from external that we're trying to make sure, and they are just as concerned as we are about making sure that only those people who need access to that tech data get access to that tech data. So one of my software developers said, I'm not worried, I said, I'm worried about one company getting to see somebody else's uh, tech data. And he's like, I am worried about a different problem. And that is those companies being able to even see their own data. Because we have really, uh, th there's only one person that gets access to the company's data, and that's what, who they deem as the corporate administrator. Nobody gets to, even if you applied, you don't get to see the data unless the corporate administrator has granted you access to see that data after you do it. I started out thinking naively that we would do it the way we've always done it. The last time I was in government, we built systems and we did our own. In the application, we did the provisioning, we did the authentication, we did it all. Um, and that's the road that I started down. And then when I learned about ServiceNow and started using it for some of our applications, um, I found out from former colleagues at the FCC, I was, I was at the FCC, that they were using Okta. And um, I, I didn't know what Okta was, but you know, if it seamlessly integrates and I don't have to build it, it seemed like a really good idea. My private sector, I was in application development. I, sold, so I, bought, I produced software, sold software, and I was like, look, if, if this has actually happened where you, know, you can buy an off-the-shelf product, I'm in. But I didn't think it was applicable to the custom applications. I thought it was only a thing for a cloud application, for, a serv for ServiceNow, for another you know, cloud platform. And um, Okta came and they told me, you know, you're wrong. You should be doing this for everything. You should be rethinking this. You should think of this holistically. And I said, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I'll buy it for the external piece, but I'm not, I'm not doing that. And then about, you know, because I'm 90% done with my identity management solution. I'm 90% done. Why would I do that? Well, nine months later, I was like, fuck this. I'm doing this. And we scrapped all of it. And we went to Okta. I said I wasn't going to do that this time. 
Um, I was at a box conference, and I and I and I um, did that. But um, you guys need to liven up, though, really, <laughs> right? You gotta. I mean, Dropping this is really helps. serious. Yeah, this is super serious. And I'm I'm a little bit weirded out by being here because I don't understand the acronyms. I don't know anything about this stuff. I didn't come up through the ranks doing identity. I, I know it's important. I don't know the buzzwords. I don't know what zero trust means. I think I might know. I, and thank you, Darren, for you know the, all those good words about it. I, I think I know more about it. I don't know about the, this thing. So um, I, I don't know about the memo, but I'm using Okta. So you know, I it, you know I stumbled into something, right? And I'm using it for everything. And then I got on the iCam. Um, you know, I don't know. Somebody somebody learned about me somewhere in the Department of State. You know, IT. I'm in the shadow IT area, but in the main IT area, they learned about me and they said maybe she should be on this this um, you know group of people that are going to look at this issue. And I said, yeah. I, I guess, I don't know, I have to go down to Maine State and talk to a bunch of people that I've never seen before. But, and um, we talked about it. And it's, it's pretty complicated at the State Department. Um, it, and, and I think they make it even more complicated than it needs to be, but it's complicated. And one of the things that I noticed um, is, is this inventorying and, and this notion that um, I still don't think everybody gets it. Like I, I still, to this day, as much as I don't get it, I think that a lot of my comrades um, don't get it. And a few of them, a few of them get it. They do. They get it. But that doesn't mean um, that it's as fast um, or, or as easy to do across the whole Department of State. But they were very smart. Um, my colleagues were very smart in that they took a best of breed approach and, um, and, and they, they, they picked products that are going to bring us through the net, through the century, you know, I mean, the, 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 we we are where we're supposed to be, and for the Department of State, that's a big deal because we kept um, uh, we, we we keep very old companies in business for a long time, um, usually, and so I think we're in the right place. And I heard yesterday that um, we had started um, that that we've deployed a piece of this in Office 365 across the department is my understanding. And maybe you can tell me if that's wrong, because you know the rumor mill is uh, vast and deep um, at the State Department. So um, I don't think we did everything right. Um, and, and where we started and where we're finished is still, we're, we're, part of, we're in that journey. Um, but but we've, we've, play, we've started, and that's the important part, I think. Well, I, I think we can all agree that identity is a journey. Uh, it's not a destination. You don't get there and stop. It continuously evolves, and it sounds like you're on your way. Yeah. Um, you, you know, one of the things that you talked about was all these different people that access your systems, access your networks. You, you know, part of what the 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 memo states, the policy that you're not familiar with, um, <laughs> but you're doing it right. So great. You know, <laughs> um, you, you know, part of it talks about contextualizing the identity. And you know, classifying the identity. Is it a federal identity? Meaning is it an employee or a contractor? Is it the public? Is it, is it a secondary identity? What context of the relationship do I have with the organization? Um, I could be, you know, in, in some aspects, I'm a Navy veteran, but I could be a Navy contractor. I could access a Navy system in two different contexts. Um, so I'm going to go to Bill, Bobby, Ted, and, and ask you guys, how does identity help solve, you know, this contextual issue? You know, how do we maintain these profiles, the access profiles? How does all this occur? Can you guys sh shed some light on that? Sure. Is my mic on? Can everyone hear me all right? Yeah. It is now. Um, first and foremost, thank you for everyone for being here this morning. And uh, I'm really excited to kind of start the discussion and really talk about identity because it's, a, it's an interesting time in the identity space right now with all the different various lines of effort that are going on with uh, the move to the cloud and really the need to understand and harness identity as a new perimeter. Um, but back to your uh, earlier question, Frank, um, identity is a moving target, right? Uh, that's the short answer. Uh, the long answer is really um, if you look at any application that comes through the door, a number of things need to happen. Uh, in order to authenticate, you need to know enough about that user in order to make appropriate decisions. 
And the challenge that I've seen mostly is the more mature your organization is, the more likely you have data around users and namely attributes across various forms of, various forms of repositories that are not just Active Directory. You have data across web applications, various cloud directories, different domains, forests, or even legacy systems like Sun and, and uh, different data sources like RACF or vice versa. Uh, in a perfect world, you would just rip and replace and feed all consuming apps a new version of the data in this specific protocol and schema. But the challenge is you have legacy apps that are mission critical in most cases and they can't be disrupted. And the moment you start altering things, uh, you need to, um, those applications will break. Um, so going back to your earlier point in terms of contextualization, I think it's important to have some sort of an attribute driven aggregation layer to connect to all your underlying repositories, abstract and federate all the data around attributes. And this is a key line of effort that's kind of differentiating with OMBM 1917 or 1917 is the importance of focusing on attributes versus credentials. Uh, create that master user profile of that user and again, identity is a moving target. Make sure that it is not only honoring the authoritative data, but also interoperable to meet existing and new mission requirements and contextualized based off the need of the mission. So if the mission requirement is these set of users with this clearance level, this time of day access, provide the right user data to the right consuming apps based off the speed and need of the mission. Bobby, Ted, anything to add to that? Um, is my mic on? There it is. Yeah, the one thing I wanted to add is, you know, in the context of modernization, I think Karen, Karen's story is a remarkable one. You know, she comes in, oh my God, I got all this old stuff. And I see a bunch of my customers here in the audience, they're, they're all kind of dealing with the same thing. And when we look at, you know, our topic is modernization, and I see two key themes. One is, hey, how do I, the State Department is a good example. How do I, how do I interface with my customer in a meaningful yet secure way? And then a flip side is, hey, how do I make my employees and contractors more productive to fulfill the mission uh, of the agency that they serve? Two completely different things. And with, with State Department, Karen has 14,863 14, yeah. yeah. you know, customers, external customers. And you know, she you made a statement there like, well, my agency doesn't really care about them. But if you think about what she's responsible in doing, it's, it's ensuring that Lockheed Martin doesn't sell F-35 you know, F Joint Strike Fighters to the wrong, wrong group. It's a super important mission. And so it's got to be one, you said your person was like, I just got to make sure that people can see their data. And you're like, I want to make sure they don't see everybody else's data. But you have to do it in a, in a fashion that is delightful and easy to use because you're licensing, you know, you're, you're managing the ITAR license, correct? Yes. For, 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 um, for defense contractors. So you got to make it easy, you got to make it super secure, you got to do it at speed. And um, you can't give all these folks cat cards or pip cards. Right. right, and we have to do third party folks too Th that right. have access to more than one company's data. And, and we, we have to do it and make sure that no one in that ecosystem ends up taking that data and giving it to someone that they shouldn't be giving right. it to. And I think when we had our conversation, speed and agility was an important part. So when you're talking to the central identity folks, you're like, hey, I'm building this new system with ServiceNow. I'm gonna have the whole workflow system. That's gonna be my case management system. That's how I'm gonna interface with my folks. The time it would take to take a legacy system that was built long before cloud and mobile and this distributed modern era, it was gonna take a considerable amount of time that you didn't, that you didn't have. And I think we made, you know, you hadn't heard of us. So I'm like, oh, like our most complex things like three months. And you're like, three. I didn't uh, believe it. I did like, not. I did not believe you it. You threw the big BS card at yeah. us, and like, I'm like, give it a shot. So you, you you give it a shot, and you know that that's what we we're able able to do. So speed and agility w was super important. Flip side, then it, then it's okay. How do I how do I deliver this same kind of joint capability to my internal users? And I think our previous speakers were talking about, hey, government knows identity. You've been doing it for a long, long time. It's not like, hey, this identity thing we should do. You, there are legacy systems uh, throughout every single government agency that, that, that they've been doing it forever. Uh, and making that change, it's a big culture change, right? Hey, let's take this legacy system or, and either augment it or, or, or replace it. And that's typically a, a longer term type, type discussion. But within, within the State Department, they kind of saw it too. And they, you know, 
there's a reason three of us are up here. Okta doesn't do the whole identity thing. Radiant Logic doesn't do the whole identity thing. Cellpoint doesn't do the, the entire identity thing. But in this new world, every organization by default is becoming a best of breed organization. You know, you're, you're no longer buying a stack, whole stack vendor and putting it in your data center. You're going, hey, I want a CRM solution. I'm going to go look at ServiceNow or Dynamics. Hey, I want a, uh, a content management system. I'm going to look at Dropbox, Box, or OneDrive. I want an email system. I'm going to go Office 365 or Gmail. And then maybe you swap. And so when you look at kind of who we are, it's best of breed for what Radiant Logic does. If you're, you're going to pull out the analyst things, top dot, sail point, identity governance, top dot, octa, top dot. So, you know, we're, we're fortunate to be in those positions right now and hopefully maintain and continue those. But the concept is if it does change, it should be easy for the government to change as well. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's great. And, you know, this all is complicated. It's not easy. Um, you mentioned that word efficiency, right? Um, and, and when we think things becoming efficient, we start to lose, um, you gotta lose something, right? You go fast, you're gonna lose something. Um, some of that can be accuracy, right? Um, how do we control the access then if we're in this fast forward mode? And until we get to that true predictive model that Darren was talking about, we need to have checks and balances in place. And those checks and balances come in the form of access policies, access certifications. We have to still do those today. Um, Bobby, Bill, do you want to um, kind of add in anything on on how you know controlling the identity and, and that context, different personas? Um, sure. Yeah. So when we talk about you know managing identities and the government's been doing it for a long time, one of the w one of the issues they've been run they've had is they manage identities, but they manage them in silos. So you have application owners, application specific identities, and really. From, a, from the memorandum standpoint, it's looking at building that, that context of aggregating all that user information to a single location so you can look at who those users are to your organization. What personas are they? Are they currently a, a, a citizen coming in to access a, a government system? Or are they an employee or a contractor? What, how are they accessing the system? So it's taking all that, those attributes and all that data and information in from the various systems and then normalizing that data so you can start making decisions. So then if you, if you know who the person is or where they came from, what kind of device they use to, um, or what kind of device or credential they use, you know, how are they proved out, how are they you know, validated, then you can start um, to use all those as different risk factors to determine whether or not, determine whether or not what should or should they, sh what should they not have access to. Yeah, thank you. Um, Bill, anything on that or um, from your side, from Radiant Logic side, do you think? I think you guys are both spot on. Uh, ultimately, it depends on you know ensuring that uh, there's data integrity, right? And we see it, or actually no one, be memo M19 or N1917, there's a line in there that says uh, the need to leverage next generation identity federation solutions to really enable cross agency collaboration. Uh, in the commercial world, we see this all the time in form of m and and it's really, the, from an identity perspective, looking at it holistically is kind of what you mentioned is going into these various different silos where data is fragmented and being able to abstract and normalize, federate uh, to make it interoperable based off of not only existing requirements, but the future. Uh, you know, Karen, you mentioned earlier with, with the State Department, uh, the culmination of these three solutions and also as Ted alluded to, uh, Every one of these three products do something different, and there's a little bit of overlap, but ultimately, collectively, as a uh, holistic solution, you have the ability to now integrate, aggregate, adapt, based off of emerging mission requirements. And I think that's also critical, uh, not only in uh, meeting requirements in the civilian space, but also three all the three lines of effort of the national defense strategy. <laughs> that was fun. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was wondering how long that was. So monetization in, in, in the memo, um, but just IT monetization, digital monetization in general, you know, we have to go through some changes, right? They're calling for identity, the way we're identity proofing, the way we're establishing identities, um, how we're granting access. That can mean a lot of change for some agencies. Mm -hmm. um, and Karen, as, you're, as you go through this journey, has there been a lot of impact on, on how the business runs now? How, um, and, and what, 
and I'm going to go out on a limb here and think yes. Um, but also, I, I want if you could touch on stakeholder involvement. Um, who else did you have to involve? You know, as we look at, at, at this model of zero trust and, and ICAM modernization, it starts touching a lot of people. When we start to get compliance frameworks involved, we start talking about compliance officers, security, the CIO, CISOs. All these people need to come together to get this done. So what kind of um, changes, you know, business process changes did your organization see and, and how did that community come together to make that happen? Yeah, so focusing, you know, primarily on our external customers, since it was the big, the biggest use case, uh, you know, we, we had in our, in our legacy systems, people had digital certs in order to file for licenses um, to be able to export munitions or tech data. And, you know, I was thinking that you know, we really need to modernize that piece. Um, we need to really think a lot about uh, identity proofing and what's a more modern way of doing this. And um, it seemed a bridge too far. Um, you know, I, I, I asked the Defense Trade Advisory Group, which is, you know, the very defense industry that we regulate, and everybody said, why don't you just not do any of that? Um, a majority of the 13,000 companies said, it's a kind of a pain, we have to get, you know, we have to do a, a, notary, a notary, we have to send this stuff out, they have to verify that the people are with our company. And then, of course, the largest of companies said, over our dead body, like, you are either going to use a CAT card or you're going to use a digital cert, because we want to be sure that our tech data is protected on your servers, and we don't Trust you. Trust you, right. So, um, so you know, we, we had a lot of those discussions. And so we continued with the digital cert through Okta. You know, it was just another authentication mechanism. And that's how people get into our system is with, um, with digital certs that are available from a variety of different companies. Ideally, the end state is that a CAT card, I mean, anything that's on the federated bridge will work to authenticate. Um, eventually, I want to be able to do, um, we have a really big problem with our foreign, I mean, we have retransfers. Um, so a piece of equipment goes out and somebody overseas says, we want to retransfer this from France to, you know, Belgium or whatever. Um, this is a foreign entity. The identity of a foreign entity, you know, is different. You know, we're not getting a notary public and a digital cert and all the rest of it. But it's some of the riskiest transactions because the piece of equipment is already out of the country and now we're going to say we want to do it for some other end use to some other person. And we don't even know who you are that is asking for this. And so this is the identity piece that is ahead of us, is making sure that we can identity proof foreign nationals that may be looking at retransferring for good reason. I mean, it could be that they want to retransfer this thing and it's going to support our mission. But we want to make sure that we know who this is and that it doesn't end up getting diverted to somewhere that we don't want it to, to, to go to, right? I mean, I'm not going to name countries or name names, but we want to make sure that this is done well. So, so what we did initially is we, we kept the status quo, and what we're doing now is we're looking at how can we expand on this now that we're in the cloud, on a platform that's flexible, how can we expand on this to make it even better and make it even more secure? But make it flexible too in terms of, you know, if somebody, if a defense contractor has a CAT card, why isn't that good enough for us? Why do they have to go through the arcane process of going and getting a notary public and getting it from um, IdenTrust or one of the other providers or digital certs? It makes no sense. Well, they should be able to use their CAT card and come into our system, and that's the interoperability. And we also have all these industry partners. I, I don't want people to have to do something other than put their cat card in a cat reader and we'll say, yeah, I got you, I know who you are and you're good because somebody somewhere has proofed you and we trust the rest of the government. I do anyway. I'm a public service, I, I trust my fellow uh, public servants. So go, going back to the stakeholder involvement, um, you know, the memo, um, the new policy, 
<laughs> does state that, that agencies reinvigorate their, their FICAM offices um, to bring back those offices that were, you know, working this problem when we were working on HSPD 12. A lot of that seemed to kind of drift off a little bit um, as, we, as we accomplished PAX integration. Um, I, I think this is critically important. I meet with a lot of customers and, and identity is still somewhat, you know, you hear little silos. Um, I think this will be a lot. And Karen, you actually mentioned you got to talk to your group that's part of the ICAMC as well. Um, that's going to be critical, and, and ICAMC meaning the ICAM subcommittee, I apologize, um, bringing that group together um, to share experiences like we're doing today in this uh, is going to be critical. Um, Ted, Bobby, Bill, anything um, to, to inject there on, you know, bringing groups together to, you know, we came together as industry. Um, do you think agencies are, are, are well connected um, when we talk to them as, as vendors or is there stuff that, you know, we see from the outside that they could be doing? Um, to, to solve this better internally. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to chime in on that. So I've seen, I've been at Okta for four years and it, I've seen a pretty radical change in terms of collaboration within, within agencies, not only within agencies, but uh, other agencies getting together. Uh, so Karen, when we first met, you were kind of an on, on an island, all right? It was, she, she just did her own thing and then, then she gets sucked into the ICAM Tiger team and becomes part of a process and you just saw what the State Department did to pull everyone together to get on a common page. Uh, within, um, and, and I'm seeing that across, across agencies now where it was like one group, they don't wanna do anything and all of a sudden now all of a sudden the C-suite, the mid-management operations, it's, it's, it's all coming together. The interesting thing I'm seeing is now agency and agency collaboration. Uh, particularly in the DoD. I held, a, I held a security workshop the week before Thanksgiving. Uh, we had Navy leadership, Air Force leadership, uh, a bunch of defense agencies getting together, and it was just a debate on exactly what were the requirements. <laughs> I was having a difficult time convincing my company what it was that they needed to build for, for DoD in terms of certifications, and I, I get one group to say, we need NIAP accreditation. Another one, I need IL-5, I need IL-4, I need to be in GovCloud. I don't wanna be in GovCloud, I want East-West. And it's like, we can't build all of that. But so getting them, you know, what we, we had uh, senior Air Force leaders say, hey, you guys not understanding what it is you need to build is delaying my ability to do what I wanna do. Can you send an invite out and get everyone in the same room? And I was like, all right, let's see what happens. And I, I send the invite out and phew, everyone shows up. If I had done that two years ago, no one shows up. Right. right. Uh, but now you've got you know, leadership across the board and there was a healthy debate between government about what it was they exactly needed. And we kind of put up there, here's everything you've asked for, we can do it all, but we can't do it all at the same time. So you know, what do we need? And we ended up crossing a bunch of things off and ended up with a definitive answer. Uh, so that's encouraging to see, right? And what's driving it is, you know, I. I really like the OMB memo because I think it's a, a de facto statement that, hey, the legacy systems we have today aren't gonna get us to where the industry and where we need to go tomorrow. So that's why you need to think about not just modernizing your applications and your systems, but it's super important to modernize the ICAM system because that's an enabling technology to make that happen. So there, I, you know, there's that statement. Uh, but the fact that government is truly going cloud, when, you see, when I hear modernization, that I hear cloud, right? A absolutely, okay. that's what I hear. So, and when that happens, traditional perimeter security gets evaporated. Yep. All right, and that's why we start hearing things like zero trust, and then you have Forrester publish their November issue of zero trust and says identity rules. So it's a main pillar, not the only pillar, but a really main pillar, and I think our two previous speakers you know, validated that as well. So um, it's, I, I think it's a super exciting time. I think culture is still probably one of the biggest obstacles uh, in, in getting there, but seeing this you know, massive collaboration happen is, is pretty encouraging. Yeah, I think going back to the comment I made earlier about identity being a journey, it's not a journey you take by yourself. No. Um, it, it, it's a journey you bring your friends along with, you bring your family <clears throat> along with, everyone comes because there's so many touch points and that'll be critical as we move forward. So we have um, a little bit of, of around five minutes left. Um, I was thinking to open up to the audience and see if we have any questions. Yes, sir. So uh, I'm uh, my name is Jerry Gordon. I'm a city contractor. 
Oh, Jim's uh, coming. We got the mic, man. My name is. Uh, my name is Jerry Gordon. I'm a CETA contractor with the Advanced Distributed Learning Initiative, which is under the uh, Office of Secretary of Defense. And um, we have a couple of interesting, maybe unique challenges, and I'm curious to see what your, your views on them. One is um, with one of our stakeholders, we have people who have multiple personas, and not everybody necessarily has the right to know everything about all of their personas. So you might have Bob Schmedley, and you might have Lord Viper Scorpion. And some people are only know, allowed to know about Bob. Some people are only allowed to know about Lord Viper Scorpion. And, so, and very few people are allowed to know that they're the same person. But there are some people who do need to know that um, mm -hmm. from a, uh, a, basically it's training and education data. But, but um, um, and then we also have the additional uh, problem of six different security enclaves that do not have a generalized cross-domain solution. So we will have to air gap, but still reconsolidate data across enclaves in order to have a complete portrait of somebody's performance. Um, and then there's the third part, which is that uh, privacy is a little different. Um, and on the one hand, you know, everybody signs this consent to monitoring when you sign onto a DoD system. But on the other hand, we actually have a collective privacy um, requirement because of operational security. Um, so. Uh, there are other people that you don't want necessarily knowing uh, access to data and particularly different aggregations of data. Some aggregations of data need to be disclosed, usually for accreditation bodies for educational institutions. Some of that needs to be available as transcripts. Some of it needs to be available for doing occupational alignment for, for transition out of the service. Some of it needs to be protected because you don't really want everybody to know that the entire 10th mountain has just received training on something because it probably gives you a pretty good idea where they're going to go. Um, so I was curious to see what you, you guys would think about those kind of unique challenges. Um, I, I'll take that one yeah, if you guys please. don't mind. Um, so, so that's a, not a unique ch challenge. Um, we talk a lot about that persona management um, when we talk to our in intelligence customers. Um, it, it's the inevitable fact that there is that challenge of building that cross-domain identity. Um, there's the, the challenge of, you know, what you mentioned, um, a lot of that's going to involve data tagging and metadata tagging um, to be able to have the right access controls. As Darren was talking about the attribute providence, that becomes extremely critical that you need to understand um, those attributes are current and accurate, so you can make those access control decisions to keep that separation of data. Um, in, in modern identity governance, we do that through multiple persona management. Um, we do that through attribute and, and, and profile aggregation, build that as much attributes as we can to use in the access control model. Um, there are some of your peers, and we can talk when we get off stage, about who's looking at and doing um, this stuff in a cross-domain environment. So, um, so great question. On the Indo uh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, Indo Paycom, uh, a week and a half ago, some of us, yeah. Frank, myself, and uh, not me, but Octa. some of our friends from Octa yeah. uh, were at TechNet in Hawaii and Honolulu. Uh, not complaining about being in Honolulu, um, but it was similar challenges, right? Uh, it was more so around, hey, um, a few years ago, there could have been different, um, we could have been at the brink of war. And in order to kind of uh, have that competitive edge um, and leverage our, and this kind of goes back to the national defense strategy, how do we strengthen alliances and how do we have a more lethal force? Um, one of their pain points was they need to aggregate, correlate, and disambiguate all this data across these different domains. So if I'm John Smith, I could be J Smith somewhere, I could be John S. Smith, I could be J Smith 89. And that is an attribute across maybe a wide array of different repositories. Uh, and that needs to be contextualized and made interoperable to not only meet the existing mission requirements, but be able to share that with various different partners. In your case, maybe different enclaves. Um, and kind of one of the proposed solutions that we offered, again, a collective best of breed, is one size does not fit all. And there's a reason why we're working together. Uh, there's a reason why uh, some of us really focus really well at access management and being able to deploy applications like ServiceNow and Salesforce and vice versa in the cloud. 
and there's really good uh, solutions that enable, and you can just look at the Gartner quadrant, you don't have to take my word for it, to enable segregation of duties, enabling offboarding and offboarding, and really putting that governance on that identity to ensure um, that uh, identity is who they say they are. And then at a foundational level, how are you aggregating, normalizing, contextualizing, and really creating a master profile of that identity to then be interoperable? And also coupled with how are you not duplicating the data? And that's one thing I really want to emphasize is uh, with, with OMBM 1917, the notion of leveraging existing authoritative sources, um, whether it's you know, Active Directory, whatever repository it is, but wherever that data is, it needs to be authoritative, it needs to be interoperable, it needs to have speed based off the need of the mission. Um, and uh, I feel as if collectively, and maybe we can all talk offline, I feel we could provide a lot of value to what you're looking to solve. Good morning, Jamie. Thanks, Jay Masroff from the SBA. This is for all the panel members. Can you talk about in each of your organizations how you're utilizing AI, artificial intelligence, and where you all see that in the very near future? Thank you. Mine will be short, so I'll be first. <laughs> uh, we're aggregating the data, and then we are sharing it with consuming apps like the likes of SailPoint that leverage AI, right? So we're not, there's no AI in Radiant Logic, but we're an integration layer, so uh, that question doesn't really apply to us. So at SailPoint, we do leverage AI. We have um, some AI tools. Actually, after the break, we're going to be going into that tool, covering that tool. So thank you for the great segue into that next session. Yeah, uh, Okta also uh, highly leveraging AI. Uh, we're a multi-tenant service, over 7,000 customers, so we can look at certain trends and things that are happening, not just within your environment, but within the entire ecosystem of partners. So we, we, we have a product that we're now launching called Thread Insights. So we take, that's definitely AI driven. Certainly from a login uh, perspective, that's also AI driven. We look at contextual access of, hey, if you walk into a building with your CAC card, get by security, you put it in a CAC reader, do you really need to then do a, uh, a username and password and an MFA or would you just log in? If you're at the Starbucks on vacation, you're logging in, okay, that's a different IP. We, you know, we learn that stuff. That's all, that's all machine learning AI driven type stuff. We're, we're at the very beginning of this, but certainly of huge, uh, investment in Okta, for sure, to, to get there. So we're out of time for the panel. Um, we're going to take a break now, and you'll hear, hear more about AI, as Bobby mentioned. If you have any further questions, the um, closing session of the day, uh, you'll have the opportunity to ask some of the speakers um, some questions that we may not hit. So keep those questions fresh in your mind, write them down, and uh, be prepared uh, for the last session. Thanks. Thank you, Frank.